Прежде чем я передам слово другому нашему докладчику, я хотела сказать пару слов о той стране, из которой мы приехали, чтобы рассказать, чтобы вы поняли, насколько тема нахальтихай, насколько тема энергоэффективность и экоустойчивость важны для этой страны. Мы приехали из федеральной земли Нижней Австрии, это самый крупный регион в Австрии, который насчитывает всего лишь 1 миллион 620 тысяч населения. Это является самой крупной федеральной землей в Австрии, можете себе представить размеры страны. Вот. Наш регион находится вокруг города Вена, который всем известен, наверное, это более, так скажем, знакомое понятие. И э, регион отличается, прежде всего, очень хорошим, очень высоким качеством жизни, очень высоким уровнем э, развития технологий. Вот. И так как э, Нижняя Австрия граничит э, с тремя странами Восточной Европы, э, мы стремимся поддерживать экономические, социальные связи с э, восточными соседями. И э, немножко идем даже дальше, постоянно у нас... Э, Происходит делегация в Россию, и в этот раз мы избрали на себя тему энергоэффективность, экоустойчивость. Вот. Этот, это понятие для нас не пустое слово. В структуре нашей организации есть кластер, целый кластер, который вот уже 10 лет посвящает себя теме энергоэффективности и экоустойчивости. И я сейчас э, прошу подняться на сцену своего коллегу, господина Алоиса Газельхофера. Он является сейчас ведущим менеджером данного кластера. У него более чем 15-летний опыт работы в этой сфере. И он расскажет о тех мерах, которые принимает сейчас э, Австрия, федеральная земля, нижняя Австрия, для того, чтобы тема энергоэффективности, экоустойчивость были не просто пустыми словами, а понятиями, которые словами, которые знает каждый гражданин Австрии, понятием, которым оперирует каждый гражданин Австрии, независимо от того, строит ли он дом, идет ли он в бюро, которое тоже построено по этим стандартам, либо просто читает прессу. Пожалуйста. Значит, что Бойк – это энергоэффективный кластер, руководителем который является Алоис. Это действительно очень интересная структура, что прежде всего важно, это независимая структура, структура, которая собирает ноу-хау, технологии, инновации во всей строительной отрасли, анализирует их, инициирует кооперацию различных компаний. То есть вы сами видели, что сейчас в структуре кластера состоит больше более 200 компаний. Это прежде всего строительная отрасль, но есть и компании из, так скажем, находящихся в непосредственной связи со строительной отраслью также. Вот. И основная цель кластера – это действительно работа с последними технологиями, отбор и анализ современных методик повышения энергоэффективности зданий. И сейчас, конечно, последний тренд – это экоустойчивость в этом плане. У кластера тоже огромный опыт, более 10 лет работы на австрийском рынке и, конечно, большой ноу-хау. Поэтому, если у вас есть какие-то вопросы по технологиям, по продуктам, по материалам, это можно будет обсудить позже непосредственно с Алоисом. Вот. Как я уже сказала, Алоис представляет правительственную организацию, да, то есть это был подход институциональный, где анализируются все методики, различные методы строительства для различных типов зданий. А сейчас я хотела бы перейти к взгляду архитектора на, на тему устойчивости вот, и пригласить нашего следующего участника. Это господин Эйтул, руководитель архитектурного бюро POS Architectas. POS Architectas это, – это имя в Австрии. Эта компания является одной из первых компаний на европейском рынке, которая начала заниматься проектами в области экоустойчивости. Вот. И у них есть очень-очень интересные референции, очень интересные проекты, которые, скажем так, хотя и построены были достаточно давно, 2008 год, это уже сколько у нас лет прошло? 8? 
Если я умею считать, да? 8 лет прошло. По-прежнему удивляет публику, по-прежнему вызывает. Не умею, не умею. 6. 6 лет прошло. Вот, а, прошу, пожалуйста, господин Эту. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Thank you for coming. Um, my relation to Russia at the moment is very close because I'm involved in the Rusev residential program. Um, Rusev is a shortcut for Russian energy efficiency facilities. It is launched by the EBRD, a financial institution, uh, with the headquarter in London. And uh, we are trying to promote the refurbishment, the energy refurbishment of uh, residential buildings in, in Russia with a focus on uh, Rostov, Natan, and Yekaterinburg. Um, I will start my, my lecture with a... Does it work? No. Ah, yeah, it works, okay. Other way around. Uh, with one of my favorite buildings, um, it is the Winter Palace of uh, Prince Eugene from Savoy. Um, actually, he he is a hero in the Austrian history and um, he was a very interesting person and um, for our event here he, he was a very, very big investor in real estate properties in Vienna and um, what you see here is uh, a building which he, he invested about 200,000 gulden of historic uh, money, it's about the value of 150 million uh, euros uh, nowadays. And it's uh, a 300 year old building and we, we still have a benefit from it. It's a hotspot of the touristic uh, life in Indiana, it's a museum, it's a very nice reception hall, etc. Um, why do I tell this? Because I think uh, Sustainability in, in terms of architecture is a very long-term issue. It needs a, a long perspective for the investor and for the architect to really do it. Um, um, so, what I would like to point out in, in, this, in, in, in this lecture is that uh, sustainable architecture needs a certain a sphere of good conditions to grow and to become rich and, and to, to, to show the benefits to the public, to the users. Um, and one major condition is the political situation actually. Uh, Prince Eugene could build this uh, palace because it was at the starting of a very quiet, peaceful period in Austria. <coughs> He uh, defeated the Turkish army, so the Austrian Empire was, was peaceful and quiet, and then they had a perspective to build up uh, and to have a long perspective and to invest a lot of money in long-term projects. Um, so um, this is one of the main circumstances. The next one is the investor actually chooses the architect. Uh, Prince Eugene worked together with several architects, but in that case he took a young uh, emerging architect, Lucas von Hildebrandt, one of the rising stars of the Baroque, Baroque time, and he really delivered a very nice uh, design for that building. Uh, so the architect sure drives the design and he has to support the investor or the public in, in terms of sustainable solutions. Uh, but at least if you sum up uh, this logic uh, line, the political condition uh, actually drives uh, the sustainable architecture. Uh, but sure, the sustainability or the level of sustainability is driven by skills and technology of the know-how and uh, at least it is driven by the decisions of the investor. Um, but so actually, if you sum up that, we do not really have uh, big excuses to do sustainable architecture. Um, since 300 years, we made a big leap forwards in terms of knowledge, of know-how, uh, of skills, of materials, of components. So actually, today we are really in a state to do very sustainable buildings in, in, in all kinds uh, of aspects. Uh, uh, so we, have, we have the means, we have the skills, and we have the know-how. 
So actually, why don't we do it? Um, um, we do it in Austria, um, in Russia too, I heard uh, recently. Um, uh, I would like to, to point out uh, this uh, one of the basics of sustainability and sustainable architecture too. This is uh, actually a discovery of the sciences of the 1930s. It is called system theory or cybernetics which firstly began to understand holistic systems, to begin to understand Earth or society as a holistic system. And so it is with architecture. Uh, you can have a very specific design approach to make nice renderings or nice pictures or nice facades, or you can uh, practice in a more holistic approach. Uh, and that includes a little bit more than nice pictures, as you can see, it, it, uh, sustainable architecture delivers several benefits. It, that it should deliver aesthetic values, it should be nice uh, looking at, it should uh, be nice for the public, then they will appreciate it. It will deliver social benefits for the user, um, and it should uh, deliver economic uh, benefits. Uh, a building or architecture that doesn't pay off is not really sustainable because it will not be built. And uh, sustainable architecture delivers environmental values because it uh, applies the know-how from recycling, etc., etc. Um, so, why is Austria progressive? I wouldn't say leading, but why is it progressive in sustainable architecture? Again, we have a very, very simple answer to that. Austria doesn't have any fossil uh, resources like Russia. Yeah? We have a cool climate, not so cool as Russia maybe, but we have some very cool regions. And Austrians really do not like to pay for heating. They almost hate it. Uh, so, um, there was a quite good basis to develop something in that, in, in that sense. And most important of that is that we have already now about 60 years of political stability and we have very nice developed science, uh, science um, uh, landscape actually in, in Austria. And we have a Green Party movement or a Green Movement since the 1970s, which was a reaction to nuclear power plant in Austria. So uh, a lot of aspects and issues and influences came together and so Austria became, since the 80s, I would say, a sort of mecca or paradise of uh, energy efficient, ecological or sustainable architecture. Uh, as you can see on the, on the map, uh, these are the uh, passive houses already built in Austria. I guess it's far over a thousand at the moment now. And um, accompanied by that, so this, this scene of sustainable architecture is fostered by several strategies or measures. One is the uh, future building program launched by the federal ministry. And we have very good higher education programs like Donau University in Krems, the future building studio, the Technik University of Vienna, etc. So there are a lot of project, projects already built in, in Austria. You can visit them, you can feel them, you can talk about them. And a lot of projects are monitored, so you have really valuable data. It's not only a promise or some calculated data, so they are really data and real projects. And you can paste the knowledges and the results of, of that uh, uh, development. So I was a little bit in the trouble which project shall I uh, show today. Um, the Schiestel House looks nice. It's uh, for the climate conditions similar maybe to by regions of Russia, but it's a small project and it's very specific touristic for alpine lists. Um, Austrian Embassy in Jakarta but doesn't make sense for Russia, it's a tropic climate. Uh, on the left, uh, right, it's a very nice project I love very much, which I developed too, is a co-housing project in Vienna. It's prepared for zero, no, it's prepared for plus energy, a residential building for plus energy. But it's under construction, construction now, and I will show it later, maybe. But uh, I decided at least to bring uh, energy base, uh, which is a regular office building. Um, but it has some features which I would like to show to you. 
So uh, it's located in a, in the developing area of, of Vienna. Uh, the developer actually was the Vienna Business Agency together with the bank. Um, it's for Vienna a medium-sized office building with 11,700 square meter rough floor area and it was completed at the same year as the Lower Austria cluster building which others showed uh, before in 2008. So this is a building which is monitored since 2008 so the data are really very reliable and we can say today that all promises made in the planning and calculations and building simulations came to root. So the building is really like it was planned and designed. Very nice for the architects and planners to keep their promises. The construction costs of 12.6 million, just to give you an idea, are cheap. It is below the average of a standard office building in Austria. Standard means high energy use, etc. Um, how is that possible, you might ask, uh, because the client was willing to shift his budgets uh, from luxury uh, items to more sustainable items in the building. Um, that was very nice for us to work, actually. Um, so here you see the, the map, and uh, I would like to point out just one thing. Uh, this is the location of energy, energy base uh, and below the, the green spot you see uh, this one is the next phase of this development it's already prepared to be built uh, and we finished or achieved recently the feasibility study for a real plus energy office building real plus energy means that this building produces more amount of energy on his building shell, then it actually uh, consumes uh, on an annual basis. So I guess this will be the next step in the, in the building development. Uh, as you see, uh, the basis of a sustainable design is a very clear design strategy which is appropriate to the property market which delivers a very flexible uh, floor plan which can be adapted in the future, um, etc. Et and which is basically cheap. Uh, so there is one uh, keystone actually for the, for the low uh, building uh, prices we, we have got there. Um, the energy base actually follows some principles which came out from a feasibility study and also which was part of a science uh, scientific study. Um, first of all, uh, it shall deliver quality in architecture, space and comfort. This is the main goal on top. Then it should be very energy and eco-efficient. Um, it should use a wide range of renewable energies as much as possible under these circumstances in 2006 when the planning was done. And uh, it should serve the user's benefit. So this is always, for us as architects, the user is uh, more or less the focus of the design and um, because we think the user actually pays at least for the building and he appreciates it and if they like the building, the building will be rented, etc. and refurbished uh, all the time. So, um, the energy targets have been very clear. They have been very clear. Uh, we should go to a very, very low extent of energy consumption and CO2 emission. Uh, what you see in the comparison is a standard uh, Vienna office building according to the building standards and the small column is energy base and these values actually are monitored and real. They are not uh, some calculation visions, they are really, really achieved uh, numbers. And here is one target uh, which an investor can give to the planners, it's very easy. Uh, it's the so-called comfort diagram, so if uh, the building mostly performs in this uh, green spot in the middle, it's a nice building to live in, to sleep in, to work in or whatever. So this is a very, very clear and precise indicator for the user and comfort quality of a building. Um, here again the figures of the energy 
for professionals in, 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 in the auditorium, you will see that heating and cooling are very low, even cooling. And uh, to mention, I, I mean, I have to mention that the left, left one is energy base, and this is the standard building to get an idea what is the building uh, code actually, or was the building code actually. And for the, uh, for the energy consumption, it has to be mentioned that about 25% of the total energy, not only heat, etc., the total energy including electricity, heating, pumps, etc., is covered by photovoltaic. Um, so, that kind of buildings should meet some certifications. It doesn't matter if it is LEED or BREEAM or whatever. In that case, it was open, accessible and very cheap. Uh, um, and not cheap uh, for free um, assessments, which have been used by the, uh, by the investor. Um, this is, can also be a very easy target for the investor. If he says, okay, the building shall reach that, it's very clear program for the architects and engineers. And sure, this kind of buildings get some reports, which is nice for the owner who badly uses that. So for the building now, um, I already mentioned one basis, which is the clear construction which makes it very cheap and, and clear and easy to build. The next one is the passive house concept. It's very easy to achieve too. You have to construct a good, very good insulated building shell and you have to apply an indoor ventilation system with heat recovery. All these materials and components are available on the market. It's easy to apply and there are lots of experiences since 20 years, I would say, so it's a safe thing. And the next thing, it's also a basic actually, is um, to do the right heating and, and cooling system for an office building. In this Vienna location, it was, uh, it was the right solution to make concrete core temperature a ceiling, so cooling and heating is made by the ceiling, and the energy is provided by groundwater. So the groundwater is used to provide the cooling and heating energy, and it is very few amount of energy because it is a passive house. And uh, so here you see the, the groundwater system with the cooling floors, and one of the basics of this project, which I would like to show you a little bit more in detail, is this very specific design in regards of uh, natural lighting and using the solar energy. So actually, for this building, as it has a large exposed facade to the south, which is usually very difficult for an office building, um, the, the facade was developed in a, in a shape that it can actually use the energy in, in several ways. So what we do here is we use the, the, the winter sun, which goes fl very flat into the building, uh, to provide a, a, to provide a uh, natural air, a uh, natural lighting, and to use the passive solar energy for, for heating. And in summer, which is actually the most interesting solution of that, uh, the facade is more or less self-shading, and it is producing electric energy, because on top of this, of this shape, the photovoltaic panels are placed. So in summer, when you have the most heat, uh, you produce uh, a lot of energy. So that is actually the technical solution. So you see the detail of one element. On top is the photovoltaic, and, and, the, and the windows are recessed in a special angle. So the effect, of it, the, the effect of that facade is that it is extremely energy efficient, and it is very well adopted to the to the Viennese uh, climate location in terms of solar angle and, and uh, ambient temperatures. It's about 400 square meter photovoltaics, which is still the largest area installed in Vienna. And um, it was invested in close to 400,000 that year. Now it is uh, much cheaper. And there have been some subsidies uh, for this installment of the photovoltaic. Uh, that is actually the scientific explanation uh, or proof uh, of this design. It was uh, proved surely before construction in the building simulation to be sure what we are doing here. Uh, the right diagram is actually the key one. 
this one. Um, it shows you the relation between, between the solar impact and the, so, and the solar production of energy. So what you see here in the summer months, the solar, the direct solar impact is, is reduced, very, very much reduced, which is very nice for the interclimate because you have to cool much less. And at the same moment, you, you increase the output of the energy generation by the photovoltaic, so you get a lot of electric energy to, to drive the, the cooling pumps to, to cool the, the building. So it's very, a very nice, uh, actually, south, a solution for a south facade. So that's the effect, about 23% of electric energy are powered by this photovoltaic. And that's actually the picture which is our ambition. Uh, we want to provide a nice indoor, indoor climate and a nice indoor situation for the users, for the people who really work there. And this uh, folded south facade gives the opportunity to make an almost two-story feeling of the room. Yeah? You have this, this uh, window where you can look out straight and then you have always this window on top where you get uh, an idea of the sky and, and, and so on. So this is behind actually the design or one of the most benefits we think of this solution, this streaming by uh, natural air, uh, light that is flooding actually the building. Even in winter time it's very nice to have. So, now I would like to have uh, present a few slides about the second feature which could be uh, realized in that project, which is a uh, natural humidification. As you might know, the dry air, the dry indoor air is always a problem in office buildings in winter time. By air conditioning, the, the air is dry and the people get sick, etc. And it costs a lot of money to the companies. So we invented or developed a natural um, humidification system by plants. It's a special grass, a cypress grass which uh, can produce humidity in a very controlled matter. So the more light you give to the plants, the more humidity they produce. So you can integrate these plants into a um, humidification process. So the fresh air streams uh, or passes by these plants, loads will be loaded with humidity, and then the fresh and humid air comes into the office building. And the second effect, which is very important for us too. You have this green peninsulas within the workspace. So actually it's an open space, but with a certain grid, every 20 meters, you have this green, green buffer room, which is a, uh, actually in that case, it is a five-story room, which gives a feeling of, of greenery and, and, and interrupts a little bit this, this daily work, uh, work procedure. So this is the techniques behind it, uh, this air flow through the plants, etc., with heat recovery and humidity recovery. And here again, almost finished, our focus in the design, the user, the quality of space, the feeling, the air, the, the light, which is very important for our design and which we think is very important for sustainable architecture. Um, so I wish you a nice afternoon and thank you for listening.